Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit iBethel.org. Grab your Bibles, open if you would to Isaiah 60, and we're going to read two portions of Scripture here, and then um, I'll probably just quote or make reference to a few others, all right? So Isaiah uh, chapter 60. Uh, For those who are a part of the Bethel family, I know we've got a lot of guests today, and a number of our guests, I know you you follow us online, so you're at least somewhat connected to what we've been talking about for the last several years. And one of the most reoccurring themes, regardless of who gets the mic, one of the most reoccurring themes uh, that we have as a church family is the heart of God for cities and nations. It's, It's the two commissions that are given uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, he met with his disciples. And on, at one moment, he gave them a commission to make disciples. But then in another one, he actually commanded them to disciple nations. Uh, there's a unique difference between the two. One is one-on-one, but we're never, in the one-on-one, we're never to lose the big picture that God is looking for actual cities and nations to reflect his nature, reflect his glory. In our effort to serve the big picture, we're never to lose the honor and the privilege of standing face to face. Um, oftentimes, our measure of anointing, I know this for my travels. I'm in, you know, I'm in crowds of, of thousands and thousands of people. And uh, it's really easy to stand and to speak and to think you have a great anointing because you move a crowd. You find out what you have when you're one-on-one. And, uh, and so I, I really fight to maintain that one-on-one connection with people following the meeting. Some might, some I'll get down and pray for folks, because that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. I'm really good with the big picture now. It's a part of, it's, how, it's, how, it's what I eat and drink and sleep, and it, it's that. It's the big picture, seeing cities and nations transformed. But uh, the, the thing that we have to fight for is to make sure the individual remains important. So anyway, but back to this concept of the cities. Um, we, we've been working on the idea, the thought of impacting our city. And I know we have a lot of guests, so... We have probably at least 50 different cities represented in this room right now. And uh, regardless of what city you are in, um, there are probably great things that God is doing, and there's great areas of need. I know in our city, uh, I've, never been, uh, I've never been so impressed in, and uh, touched by what I see God doing in a city in my whole life. I've never seen anything like it. We have such areas of deep need. We have such areas of deep crisis that it would be easy to be caught up with that and ignore the incredible things that God has already done. And I've, I've watched it for years. I, I moved here with my family in 1968, so it's a few years longer than some of you have been alive. And, uh, and we, I, I remember, I remember just seeing stuff then and seeing what's happening now. I'm just really encouraged. But I also live with the same awareness, all of you who live in Reading, uh, this area, this region, very painfully aware at times of what our crisis, what our needs are. And Jesus has a solution. And I, I guess what I'm looking at today is he has given us some very biblical procedures to go through. And those procedures listed are not to elect different officials to serve us in government. I believe in having the right people in position. I believe in uh, politicians uh, putting together good policies that help a city or help a nation. I believe very much in that. It needs to, that stuff needs to matter to us. But l- let me tell you one of the secrets of the kingdom. If there's not breakthrough here, the policies out there won't work. They won't be long-lasting. Yeah. The breakthrough here is what changes the atmosphere of thinking and value system and the way people relate to each other. The relational component is established by believing believers in an area. The anticipation to uh, that there are answers available for anything that looks impossible. That comes from the people of God who have been commissioned to invade the impossibilities of life. And so it's part of who we are and that influence in a city. We're going to get into some of the specifics in a moment, but, but uh, you know, give yourself to vote correctly and to think through the issues and live with, with real conviction. Some things are black and white. They're easy. Others, they're, they're really 
they're, they're really challenging issues that we face. And we just, I, I look at them and I go, oh my goodness, I, I'll, I'll talk with friends from another country of what they're facing. And, and I have an opinion, but I tell them, I said, listen, I respect your opinion more than mine because I don't live there. And uh, my decisions don't, don't affect my life about your country. I trust your perspective. And I've had some good conversations with people through the years. The, the point being is that we work hard to do everything correct politically. We, do hard, uh, we work hard to do everything correct uh, socially, economically. But the bottom line is what we do in the house of God, what we do in our personal walk is really what determines the measure and level of breakthrough and how long that breakthrough will be sustained in the area. So that's what I want to talk to you about. All right. Oh, you know what? I should probably, well, no, let's, let's just read the verses first. All right. Isaiah 60, we're going to read three verses here. Then we'll skip to 61 and read four more. All right. And then that'll, that'll kind of set the stage for what I want to do today. All right. Verse one of Isaiah 60, arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness, the people, but the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles, or New American Standard Translation says nations, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. I know that this is a very familiar passage, and rightly so. I know for me, my life was forever changed on a Thursday afternoon in May of 1979 when the Lord spoke to me out of these, out of these verses. It changed my life. It's changed every day of my life since this encounter with the Lord over this chapter. I read it often for me personally. I have read it countless times. Oftentimes when I sign books, I will actually put this address down, Isaiah 60 verse 1, as a, a reference point to bless uh, the reader with. The point being, these are familiar, but you could study this, these three verses for the rest of your life and never exhaust what God is saying. And uh, so I, I, I want to challenge you in these verses. Let's read chapter 61, the first four verses, and then I'll talk to you about the context, what I believe the Lord is saying. Verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Perhaps you re remember this phrase. It's what Jesus quoted at the beginning of his ministry in, his, in uh, Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. All right, now notice in the first three verses, we're talking about people in need. How many of you came to God as people in need? All right, so we all qualify here. We're in the first three verses. But the point being is that he takes broken people, broken in identity, broken in their own uh, relationships, broken in their own mind. One of these words actually refers to shattered minds. Their own mental health and wellness is, is, has been compromised through experiences in life. <clears throat> Some of these are diseased or afflicted. Jesus brings redemptive touch, healing to each of them, and the broken become oaks of righteousness. Now, we used to, in Weaverville, I, I, we, I was there 17 years, we only heated our house with, with, uh, with wood. We, we didn't even have a backup electric heater. We didn't even have a little tiny space heater to put in, in the bedroom. We only had wood heat. And, uh, and we would drive back on these roads, and old logging roads. <clears throat> and these old logging roads, you know, it was, they were logged like 10, 20, 30 years ago. And they have trees growing on the roads. And if it was a pine tree, you just take your truck, you just go right over it because the pine tree just bends with you. When you pass it, it springs back up. Pine tree this big would just bend over. You hit an oak tree like that, you got a problem. That oak tree is not budging. You have now got a dent in your bumper because that oak tree is different than a pine. You run into that thing, it says, no. No, I will mess up your car. And that's, the Lord says, these people that were once unstable are now the most stable. Even, even in their youth, 
their strength is beyond comprehension because they're anchored into something that's eternal. And then he defines the purpose in verse 4. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I want to use this, uh, this verse in two different ways as we kind of get this started this morning. <clears throat> First of all, we all qualify as the broken that have been healed and redeemed. But also the value that we have for people who, you know, people who cannot speak for themselves. Sometimes it's the disenfranchised, it's the rejected of society. Sometimes it's those who have brought so much damage on their own life that they don't fit in anywhere. Sometimes it's self-imposed. And yet, how do we treat those? How do we treat the most despised? How do we, how do we treat the most broken? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, what do we do with the addict, with the homeless, with the, you, you just fill in the blanks, the people that have great, great need. Oftentimes, the hope for our city is seen in how we treat the people with greatest need. Yeah. When we respond to the special needs kids in that way, when we respond to those that are in crisis, maybe self-imposed crisis, but it's crisis nonetheless, yeah. and we serve them, what we're doing is we are positioning people to help in the rebuilding of cities because the Lord is looking for cities that will love him well. I, I, just, I have this, this confidence, this faith, this, this conviction for my city to love God well. I want in the end for it to be said, Redding, California, the name Redding in the Dutch means salvation. So I want the city of salvation to love him well. And I want the fact that Sacramento River, the river of sacrament, that flows through the city of salvation to prophesy the grace and the nature of God that is seen well, tasted of, and experienced in the relationships, in the economics, in the uh, creativity, in the, in the, in the uh, delight that children have to grow up in this city. I want it seen in every part of our city. But the, part of the key here is just restoring broken people and getting the broken people that have been healed into service so that we see our city changed. I, I don't have time. Actually, what I have in my heart would take me weeks, and, and I don't feel I'm supposed to do that. I'm just going to skim over the surface and just do the best I can, leave you in as much confusion as I possibly can <clears throat> so that you actually have to pray to get an answer. That's kind of my goal. Um, the Lord is commissioning us to bring his world into this one. So we know the prayer, the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The rest of the prayer is specific applications of what was already stated. The will of God on earth as it is in heaven. When it talks about forgiveness, when it talks about provision, when it talks about temptation, all those things fall under the category on earth as it is in heaven. Jack Taylor, one of our dear friends, great Southern Baptist uh, preacher, amazing author, he told us years ago, he said that phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done, can actually be translated like this, kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done, because it's actually not a request, it's a decree. It's a part of a prayer where we position ourselves, not begging God to do something, because we already know his will. If you beg him to do something when you already know his will, then you don't know his nature. So he says it's a declaration, and in fact it is. It's kingdom of God, come, kingdom. Kingdom is not a place. It's a dimension of his rulership. Kingdom is the realm of his dominion. That's why when the kingdom touches cancer, no cancer remains because there's no cancer in his rule in heaven. There's none there. All right. So here we have this prayer on earth as it is in heaven. And so we look at this theme and it's very easy to put ideas, strategies together um, for how to make this city more like heaven. 
uh, how, how to help serve in the economy, how to help with relationships, healing families, broken uh, families, uh, how to bring healing. And we can strategize, and, and I believe we should, to bring healing to the broken parts of our society. But the key is not in any of those things. The key is in what Jesus told us to do. He said, pray. He said, here's the big secret. Pray. And pray. Yes. Thanks. I always feel so good when you spontaneously respond like that. He said, pray. And when you do, keep these things in mind. I want my world influencing yours. So declare it. I want you to address the issues of relationship, personal need, personal character, move into praise. Keep these as primary focuses of your prayer life. But to get my world to invade yours, it's not going to come apart from prayer. So the point I want to make is, is that all these things that we want to see happen in our city or our nation, important things, vital political decisions. Sometimes I look at the crises that our political leaders are facing. We've had conversations with a number of them behind, behind doors, closed doors, and they know they don't have an answer. The problem is far too deep for, for just a political solution. And what we need is we need God. We just need God to show up and give a wisdom uh, to help people navigate some of the challenges in life. So I believe in po politics. I believe in voting well. I believe in thinking through things well. I get all of that. But the point is, is that without the people of God who have the responsibility to seed the clouds, so to speak, with prayer, with intercessions, with decrees, with confessions of what God's heart is, without those things taking place, all these political decisions just fall on dry, dry ground. They have no impact. But when the church prays, it's amazing how wise politicians get. Listen, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, pol politicians on both sides of the aisle have an earnest desire to help the city, help the nation. Let's be frank. They can make a whole lot more money doing something else. They, they, they have a servant's heart to serve and to help. So we have the responsibility to adopt them no matter where we think they fall and our opinions of things. We adopt them with, with a loving affection and pray for them and pray not against them. Don't accuse them before the Lord You're, unless you want to partner with the accuser of the brethren. So just be, be, a, be a supportive prayer and pray for them by name. All right. Now, here's, here's what I want you to look at. There's this strange series of references to feet throughout the Bible. And I don't think it's an accident. Um, for example, <clears throat> Job talked about his, his own feet. Now, if, if you're new to this, it's prophetic language, means, which means it's symbolic. It represents something. All right? So Job talks about his own feet dripping with butter. Will of God right there, butter. There's not a cookie on the planet that's worth anything that does not have as a primary ingredient butter. <laughs> Eric, you and I, mm. amen. What is a cookie without butter? Compost. Compost. <laughs> Thank you. He said, my, fit, my feet drip with butter. That's kind of a weird, gross picture until you understand what he's saying. He's saying, everywhere I go, there, there are drippings of the blessing and the anointing of God on my life. I leave behind me everywhere I go. There's, this, there's an influence that is left once I am gone. Now, this, this may get a little weird, but just maintain, hold with me for a moment. In Weaverville, we... Uh, we would do what we do here. We just gave ourselves to prayer, to intercession. We, we would worship into the night. We had prayer meetings that went long into the night. And, and we just did this year after year, 17 years. And uh, we, just, we just did this year after year. And this one building that we had, uh, we had that one for, goodness, I think eight or nine years that I was there. And, um, and we sold it to another, another church because we needed a, a bigger building. And one of the uh, members of the new congregation... I went to see 
a doctor who was a part of our congregation. And she went in for some examination of some sort. And she said, you know, by the way, what did you guys used to do in that building? Because there's this, there's this presence that is just in the building. I don't have a theology for that. I just have a testimony. Uh, all I know is that we would show up at the town theater on Sunday morning, worship God with all our heart and mind, and Sunday night they'd show Poltergeist or some other edifying movie. And it was, it was just powerless. We'd have people tell us. They could feel when they would come in to watch a movie, they could still sense just the presence of God in that place. So many people say, well, we shouldn't have church in a theater because what if we get influenced by the darkness that's in there? What? You, you mean you can turn on darkness and it chases light away? Give me a break. That's just silly. I, I look for those things. I, I like that stuff. Years ago, here in, in uh, Reading, we, uh, I was part of a youth group. I was actually a youth member at one time. <laughs> it's so funny. I was, I was at an event here recently, and there was this very, very old couple sitting there, and I was walking down the aisle shaking hands, and, and they said, we're so glad you're here. And I was wondering, well, you know why? And they said, we, we thought we'd be alone. And what they were saying was, we are the only old couple here and there's all these young people. And I looked at them and I thought, man, I'm not near as old as you. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. And then I look in the mirror and I discover. So anyway, <clears throat> that's, that's absolutely true. <clears throat> when I was a part of the youth group here, our, our, uh, our youth pastor, Chip Worthington, was uh, just intensely devoted to prayer intercession. And uh, I owe him so much just for many things, but that alone uh, changed my life. And he just, he, just, he just imparted this grace for us just to pray. And, you know, we just didn't know enough. We didn't know enough to think that we'd have any hope of shaping the course of history, and we were ignorant enough to actually believe that God listened to us. and that a small handful of teenagers was a majority. And so we'd pray. I remember, I remember asking for the keys to the church once, and, and uh, we just came down, there, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 of us, just to come pray all night. We just wanted to pray all night. We got tired, sleepy, drowsy. You know, we fought our way through, but we did. We prayed. We prayed all night. I remember we'd just, we'd just meet different places and pray. I remember one time we wanted to... We just wanted to get, it, get away from the crowds. And it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, midnight, 2, somewhere in there. And we decided to go out to Whiskey Town Lake. And we knew of this level area we could just stand. And so we, we got out there. It's a moonlit night. And we're out there. And we're just singing, standing in this big circle. You know, where most kids are about 18 years, to maybe 20 years old and in that area. And we're just standing there. We're just singing, singing. Songs. We didn't have some of the great choruses we have today, but, but I remember we just stood there and we'd just sing forever, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And we thought we're the only ones there in the woods in this level area. And we got about 25, 30 of us just standing there just worshiping the Lord, just wanted to get time alone just to pray for a city or nation for the youth. It was in the middle of the, the whole hippie thing, uh, drug abuse, real extreme. Uh, immorality, extreme, 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 flaunted. And uh, so we're just there praying and just wanted God to, to do something. And now we noticed that, uh, that we weren't alone anymore. People started coming out of the bushes. And what, what we had no idea of is there were all these parties where people are getting wasted back in the trees, back in the Manzanita bushes and stuff. There's campgrounds around us and people were just, you know, they were just doing what they do when they're in the middle of the night, you know. And, uh, and they started coming out of the bushes and just started standing around us. And, and we'd just be worshiping, singing, and we'd look back, and somebody would be standing right at us just staring. And it was, it, was, it was the weirdest thing. They just they came out of the woods, and this crowd of people just surrounded this group of 25 that are just singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. I remember stepping out of the, out of the circle where we were just singing, and, 
and, uh, and just stepping back and talking to someone here. And these people are meeting Jesus just standing around this crowd. It wasn't the purpose for the gathering, but it was the bonus. You know, it was like, we thought we were alone. We're not. Let's take advantage of it and love on people. And, and we did. And these people are having encounters with the Lord, just standing around this group of teenagers that don't know enough about prayer to, you know, to write a chapter in a book, let alone a book. And yet the impact was great because it was honest. It was simple. Sometimes we know so much, we get muscle-bound to become completely ineffective. We have to return to childlike status, become simple, simple in faith and trust in the Lord. I remember another time we, uh, there was a market downtown that was, uh, the, the store didn't deal in drugs, but drugs were openly supplied outside of the store. And the drug trafficking that went on uh, at this store was crazy. And the, the, just, just the stuff that would go on, I, I won't go into stories, but it was, it was such a crazy part of culture, youth culture at that time. And um, so all these people, there's just people all over outside because they're either buying or they're getting stoned or they're doing something. This, this is going on all over in front of the store. And it's day after day after day after day forever. And uh, so one night... Um, our youth pastor thought, let's just go down there and pray. And so we did. We got about 25 or 30 of us again in this big circle, and the market has a parking lot here, and we didn't inter- want to interrupt. It's like 2 in the morning, but we just moved over to the side a little bit so that they could still have people in because the store was open. It was a 24-hour-day store. And, uh, and we, just, we just, once again, just stood there just praying, praying for God to do something powerful in our city and powerful with the youth and and uh, uh, the man, the manager, owner, whatever, came out of the store, and he began to laugh and to mock, you know, what was going on. And, you know, you, if you don't run into the devil now and then, you may be walking the same direction. So I, I tend to get encouraged by, by opposition. So if, uh, when people throw stuff at me, it just affirms. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for affirmation. Sometimes you get a lot of affirmation, a lot of encouragement. So we stood up there, and, and the guy called the police. And so the police came, and, you know, because uh, dealing drugs out there is one thing. But when you get people praying, that's now, now we've crossed the line. We have crossed the line. There are people praying. Can you believe there are people praying outside of our doors? And the policeman drove up, and, and our youth leader went over to his car. And he, he said, what are you doing? He says, we're praying for you. And he said, thank you. And he took off. <laughs> he said, that's, that's good. I could use it. So. But, you know, this was a Friday night. And this may be a little hard for some of you to believe, but that was a Friday night, and never again was that place used for trafficking drugs. It actually stopped that night. I drove by the next night. There's nobody there. Now, you have to understand, this, this is a part of the regular routine. You drive by this place. You see the crowd. You know what's going on. It's gone on forever. And uh, I drove by Saturday night. No one was there. Sunday night, Monday, you, you go by. The week later, go by. No one was there. Except for those shopping in the store. But none of the trafficking that would go on up front. Years later, I was talking with a friend about this particular story. And at that time, he was not born again. He wasn't saved. And when he heard that story, he told me, he said, I bought drugs there. And I came on a Saturday night to do what I had always done. And there was nobody there. Now I know why. And and he actually came on the night following our Friday night prayer meeting at that place where it ended. What's the point? Your prayers are more powerful than you give them credit for. The significance of 25 young people that decide one evening, you know, drugs shouldn't be sold openly like that. It's not right. Let's pray. They prayed. Literally, it ended. I can go on to more stories that are are a little bit scary, and I'm, I'm not interested in doing that today. But where a prayer meeting was called that ended certain things, ended certain activities... The point is this, your feet drip with oil. Why? Because you spend time with God. He told 
the Lord told Joshua, Joshua 1 verse 3, he said, wherever your foot treads, that have I given to you. Some t- things we try to influence long distance. He says, you want to change it, get in it. The scripture says, how blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. Feet imply going somewhere. Ephesians 6, he says, my feet are covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, there's people I'm going to run into today that are experiencing chaos. I'm coming into their life with a readiness to bring peace. Jesus, uh, in Hebrews it says, and you will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Here's the big strategy. Walk and pray. Go for a walk. Pray. Pretty powerful, isn't it? You want to see the city change? Walk the streets. I'm, I'm serious. Just walk the streets. Walk and pray. Realize that your feet drip with butter. Get time with the Lord. Get along with the Lord. What did he do here? He announced to us his intention for us to rise, take our right place before God, our right place before man, so the glory could be seen upon us, so that there'd be something of heaven cooperating with our intention to represent him well, Isaiah 60. 61, he declares, the Spirit of God is upon me. That word anointing, anointed, means to smear. It's like rubbing sunscreen oil all over you, except Jesus is rubbing the Holy Spirit all over you. You're dripping with presence. Everything you touch, you just leave a mark. I can tell when we have people around here that walk around the buildings praying for us because I see little drips of oil down our door where somebody came. (laughs) The point is, do you want to see a difference in your neighborhood? Do you want to see a difference in the city? Take him with you and walk and pray. Be simple enough, childlike enough that we just think actually God listens to us. Tragedy happened on our river trail a week or two ago. So go on prayers and pray. Because it's never to happen again. It's not right. It's not okay. And you have authority. Pray. Pray. Here's somebody who's sitting on a plane. He's sitting next to a believer. He doesn't know it. He pulls out pornographic magazines to read on the plane. The guy next to him is praying. Oh, God. And the guy comes under such conviction, he throws the magazines down and says, I can't read these. I can't read these. Why? Because somebody has drippy feet. Was sitting next to him who carries just this sense of presence, this divine presence into the plane that helps the values of people around you. You walk into a home of a friend 
who doesn't know the Lord, maybe has no interest. You don't have to blast them, just love them. But realize God is with you. I would go into these stores, you know, for years, these stores with just, you know, not always good things. You know, they sell legitimate stuff, you know, like health food and all, but then cultic material too. And I love shopping there. I do. Not to, not to show off or to put down. I, I like these people. I love these people. I, I would ask about how their business is doing to show interest in them. But when I walk in, I make sure that my feet were dripping with oil. I made sure my feet were, were covered with the readiness of the gospel to bring peace where there's chaos. All they know is chaos. The owner takes me aside and says, Bill, something's different when you walk in the store. I wasn't the only believer that shopped there, but I might have been the only one that stopped outside before I went in and said, God, just cover me. Cover me so that, so that I can be a blessing for them. The point is, I want to see Redding saved. I don't mean just signing, you know, a conversion note, you know, at the end of a service. I'm a transformed city, and I invite you, whatever city you're in, go for walks, but walk and pray. Let's stand together. I suggest you do it early in the morning, however, in this heat. <laughs> Don't have to raise anyone from the dead because of a heat stroke. You know, you know there are tremendous testimonies through the years of things that have happened in neighborhoods and cities just because of the simple act of walking and praying. Your prayer for your neighborhood or your street or your city or your nation grabs the attention of heaven because it's his heart too. And the whole issue of the Spirit of God coming upon us was to see restored cities. It's not just so that we can be a blessed people. It's not so that we see miracles and feel better about our life. The gifts on us are for the sake of people around us. It's all to serve and to make a city better. What would it look like to have an economy that was 100% influenced by God and his values? What What would it be like to have a city where every family lived with the influence of kingdom values, the way they treated one another, the way businesses treated each other, educational system that raised children with a sense of destiny and purpose, that there's a purpose for every one of their lives, regardless of their skill level, regardless of their intellectual capacity, every one of them. It's his kingdom. It's the heart of God. And it's got to become my heart and yours. So, Father, I do ask that you release a unique grace for praying. Simple, just turning walks in the mall as a, to do a prayer walk just to see things change. Lord, we, we cry out for our city to really see a greater visitation than we've ever seen before. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.